Hola, friends. So today is our second installment of Being Real. And I am exploring being real in our relationships. Ah, I know I talk about relationships a lot, but I think, you know this adage, those who can't teach? I like to think of myself as that person that is teaching about it because I have not been superly successful in my relationships, honest to God. But then again, I ask myself, what does that mean? What does it mean to be in a successful relationship? And it's successful according to who? So let me tell you a little bit about my own story. So I got married at the age of 27 um, to an English boy in London. And we lived in East London at the time. We lived in East London, actually the whole time before we moved here. But we lived in East London. So we came from such completely different backgrounds. Okay, I was Kenyan. He was English. I came into my marriage a virgin because of my different, my, just my, my own moral rules and how I'd been brought up and coming from a very Christian background. So at 27, I was a virgin. I think I'd kissed two boys. Um, yeah, by then I think I'd kissed two boys before I met my, my ex-hubby. Um, and I just never, I was, I was so inexperienced, like completely inexperienced. And he, on the other hand, had had um, serious relationships. He'd been engaged. He was, he was 28, so he was just one year older than me. But then our experience level, as far as relationships were concerned, were totally different. So we were already starting on different lanes as far as I was concerned. The other thing is I came from a relatively affluent family background, you know, when I was a kid relatively affluent background, um, traveled the world, seen things, spoke different languages. You know, I, I was exposed as far as culture is concerned. He had lived in one place all his life, in East London all his life, from a, a fairly humble background. And we had, I used to laugh about this, and we, we used to laugh a lot about this because we had such different, um, not really values, but different ways of seeing life. He. He was simple. He was a very simple person. He liked the simple things, you know. He'd be happy with watching a good TV show, um, getting home before it was dark, um, reading a good comic, or going to some convention where they were talking about comic books and superheroes, who he said like had literally brought him up. And I liked the artistic sort of wacky things, like taking a walk along Hyde Park or going on vacation and taking the speed train, you know, and, and, and saying we should do France, you know, we never did, but you know, like it was part of the things we wanted to do. Let's hop on the Eurostar and go and see France and eat some delicious, you know, pretzels or whatever and come back home. And, but those are the things I think, I think innately, those are the things that kind of worked for us. The, the fact that we were very um, capable and able to, to say the things that we wanted. And I didn't um, ridicule him or laugh at him when he wanted to do his comic book things. And even if he'd roll his eyes at me, he'd still come with me for those walks, you know, and, and those like fancy romantic blah, blah, blah things as he put them. And um, for instance, on our honeymoon, we went up north in England on our honeymoon. And <laughs> believe it or not, we carried an entire season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel because these are shows that he liked so much. I mean, these are like comics as well. He liked them so much and he really wanted me to watch them. And before that, I'd be like, there's no way I'm watching these things. Are you serious, Angel, really? But I watched the first like few episodes and the entire honeymoon, and we're not outside walking or seeing the sights. We were in the room watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. And that is something that someone would be like, why the hell would you take that on your honeymoon? But for us, it's something that he wanted to do and I found I enjoyed it, so we did it. I, I look back at, at my relationship and try and figure out when it was that we started going our different ways. And honestly, I think a lot of it had to do with society and expectations. I say sometimes that these were the third and the fourth people in our relationship society and expectations. And I mean, there's a lot of things that went on between when we were so happy and excited to discover each other and discover these different people to the point at which these things were not working anymore. 
I think part of it on my part was in my head, I thought I knew what a man was supposed to be, how he was supposed to act if he loved you, what you're supposed to do if he valued you. I had all these tick lists because growing up, that's what we had been taught. Write down your list, tick it off, tick it off, tick it off so that you're sure that your relationship is going in the right direction. And for him, he was more of a, why are we turning this into a textbook? Let's just do it. Are you happy watching Buffy? Let's watch it. Do we want to go and live, um, I don't know, in a, in, a, in a little box? Let's go do that, you know? And then when we're tired of the box, we'll move somewhere else. So for him, he, he was a very, like, relationships should not be structured and they should not fit in anything. Actually, his whole outlook on life was like that, whether it was religion or, you know, even education, whatever it was. It's like, do whatever you want. That was his his mantra and at the time for me my mantra was you have to follow some certain boxes because there's a reason those pillars are there and we kept clashing because of that now when i come back to present day and i ask myself what is it that makes a relationship work because i've seen too many that are not working I knew what didn't make it work, which was, um, again, I say society, society and expectations. And I ask myself, then what is it, what is it that, that would send us in the right direction? And I've discussed this a lot with, you know, my friends and, and, and with my sisters. And there was a day we were sitting and I said, you know what, I think if we run our relationships the way we run our um, relation, our relationships like romantic or when we're getting married, you know, the way we run our relationships in our original families with our siblings or with our girlfriends if you're a girl, with our boys if you're a, if you're a guy, I think would be a lot more successful. Why? Let me tell you. There are three pillars, four pillars, four pillars. So if you look at these relationships with our brothers and sisters and our parents that make those relationships last. The very first one, the basic pillar number one, I think is being secure. We are secure in our families because you know your mother and father will always be your mother and father. You know your brother and sister will always be your brother and sister. You might not like each other. Sometimes you will disagree. Sometimes you'll be miles apart. You'll be miles away from each other. But fundamentally, you know these people are gonna be there. You know they're gonna have your back. You know, today the two of you might, must, might be fighting like siblings, you know, they fight a lot. But you try bringing a third person into that scene and you see these two will gang up against that person if that person is attacking one of them. So the, the level of security we have in our original families or with our friends, it's, it's, it's so strong that we are almost always secure no matter what else is happening. You're not afraid that tomorrow your mother is not is going to call you and say you're no longer my daughter. You know, I mean, I, I'm talking about the average. And, and from my own family's perspective, you your family is your family. And so for me, number one, I think the, the, the first thing is security, right? Being secure. If you're secure, if you can find security, if you know this person has your back, that relationship has a strong chance of working. The second one, which is kind of like tied to the first one, is not demanding and i know that sounds a bit paradoxical because we've said security is important but at the same time you'll never demand it why <clears throat> you won't demand it because you know it's there because you know it's there there's no reason for you to keep demanding it i like to give this example if i call my sister and she doesn't call me back right away i'm not going to be pissed at her i'm not going to be like how come you didn't call me back? It's because you don't value me. It's because you must have been talking to somebody else. Who else were you talking to? I'm just like, I've called Emma. She hasn't called me back. She'll call me back when she gets around to it. And she does. She calls me back when she gets around to it. And it's fine. You know, I'm supposed to meet Tandy for lunch. She couldn't make it. It's okay. We will do the next one. We are secure. And so we do not demand. You don't get pissed off at your mother because... She goes for a Chama meeting every Saturday and you wanted to go shopping and she wasn't there. You're not gonna, you're not gonna feel jealous about that Chama. You're not gonna get pissed off at your dad because he came home and watched TV and went to bed and you guys didn't talk, okay? You won't. 
and I'm not saying like these are things that like people should habitually do. Of course, we have to um, nurture our relationships. But I'm saying the norm, the norm is you accept that these people have lives. And because you accept that they have lives and you know they have your back, the demands are dropped. So that's number two. Number three is acceptance of exactly who they are. Why do I say this? Have you ever visited these families where you've been invited to a different family's meeting <laughs> and you arrive and you look at these guys and you think, these people are demented. How do they possibly get along with each other? There's a crazy one that's hogging all their attention. There is a quiet one that looks like they don't want to be there. There is the one that is in a mood. You know, there is the one that thinks they know everything. There are all these, all these elements and all these different layers in this family meeting. And you as the outsider are looking at them like, how does this thing work? But it does. Why does it work? Because they accept each other. When was the last time you tried to change your mother? You might not like what she does. You might not even agree with what she does or her philosophies or her thoughts. But you're not going to try and change her. Why won't you try and change her? Because you fundamentally know she is who she is. And it's not your job to make her a different person. It is your job to love her anyway and understand her anyway, even when you don't agree. It's the same with our siblings. And we'll sit and we'll talk, ah, that one, she's always, you know, jumping into another relationship. Surely, what's wrong with her? But you won't try and change her. You might advise her. You know, you might um, tell her, listen, maybe this is not the way you should do it. But you won't try and change her. You will accept her exactly who she is, um, as who she is. Acceptance. And the last one, I think, is just doing whatever you want. In families, families, <laughs> they do what they want. People do what they want. You know, you tell your, your people, listen, me, I'm off to Australia. They'll allow you to go off to Australia even if they don't know why you're going to Australia, you know, because we add whatever we want to our families. There are no two families that are the same. Our traditions are different. Some families over Christmas, they want to watch TV. Some, they want to travel. Some, they don't even want to see each other, you know. We do what we want. So if I was to wrap them up, I would say, number one, again, it is security knowing that these people have your back. Number two, drop the demands. Drop the demands. Trust that this person is, because they love you and because they're there, they are gonna give you the best of themselves. Drop the demands and you'll get what you want. Number three, acceptance. You met this person as an adult with a life and a background. Stop trying to make them this character that you build in your head you know accept them exactly as who they are and you'll find so much richness in this as opposed to the two-dimensional character that you think they should be and number four add whatever you want screw what other people say screw what you're supposed to do screw what you're supposed to be between the two of you an agreement between the two of you add whatever you want. These are the things that I think make our relationship stronger. And of course, there is, you know, the chemistry and the sex and all those other yummy things <laughs> that we give to each other. But yeah, I think those are the fundamentals. And because I can't, I'm teaching. So you tell me what your thoughts are. This is Life with Mona.